handyman helped himself to some stuff out of the laundry and was captured on tape. And I remember this was on Facebook, you know, before Twitter existed. Um, and and obviously everyone on, who was my Facebook friend was watching it at the same time. And we had what you would normally say now these days would just be a normal sort of Twitter discussion of everyone talking in real time. But it was actually very unusual back then of sort of about 15 people going, what did we just see? <laughs> Yes. Yes, I do. I do remember them. And I can't, why did we, what, what was it about? I can't remember, but I do remember them, what they looked like. Were they shipwrecks? Yes. Yeah, yeah but and then they I looked think it like possibly and true. sounded, like, oh, sorry, Ben, you go. I think it, it turned out not to be true, didn't it, in the end? The yes. Holmes show actually yes. had this this fascinating line of, of scammers who would deceive it and then it. they would and they'd have great ratings from that and then they'd also have great ratings from busting the scammers and exposing them. There was a guy called Giovanni Di Stefano who who was on the Holmes show. This is way back in the eighties sort of saying that he was, you know, a European billionaire who had come to New Zealand. To sort of <laughs> and, and then later they found out that he was a guy called J Jeffrey Stevens or something. And, <laughs> and so those were two big Paul Holmes character arcs where first he was introducing the billionaire Jeffrey Di Stefano to the New Zealand public, and then he was ex exposing him as a scammer. I think those moments for me in television where we have done a parody that's been so good that nobody's quite sure whether it's a parody or not have really stuck in my mind. Um, so obviously Forgotten Silver, but when I was a kid, town and around, black and white television, I'm very old, uh, Turkeys and Gumboots. And I, it was a, um, a current affairs show and they showed a farmer who was farming turkeys and to look after the turkeys well, they were wearing gumboots and running around in the in the paddock and it was it was my first understanding that adults could be serious adults could be very very funny it was just delightful no oh, bless Yes, I was for a couple of years in the 1980s, indeed. <laughs> oh, it was the best job in the world. I just loved that job. I got fired from it, of course, but I really, the two <laughs> years that I was there, it made me very happy. <laughs> we, we, we both did that, didn't we? You, you seem to have you seem to have done a bit better in broadcasting than I have since then. Thank you.
New Zealand First Leader and Deputy Prime Minister. Wellington Sky Stadium says it's ready to host a blockbuster clash between the Hurricanes and Crusaders later this month if COVID restrictions are relaxed. The Chief Executive Shane Harmon says they're ready for the match on June the 21st. We're likely to have some distancing measures around catering and toilets, etc. And prior to lockdown for the last few events, we did have additional cleaning measures, hand sanitizer stations and lots of public messaging around the venue, which we would expect would continue. But hopefully nothing that will uh, make it too operationally difficult to comply with. Wellington Sky Stadium Chief Executive Shane Harmon. Courses in fields, including building and youth work and all apprenticeships, will be free from July the 1st. The government has announced which industries will benefit from its $320 million targeted training fund. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. The fund announced in last month's budget covers the costs of all apprenticeships for the next two and a half years. It also covers vocational courses in specific industries. For the next six months, those industries are the primary sector, construction, community support, manufacturing and engineering and road transport. The Education Minister, Chris Hipkins, says the list of targeted industries will be updated for 2021. He says the scheme will save people between two and a half and six and a half thousand dollars a year. Call John Gerritz and TNA. The Police Minister Stuart Nash says there's no systemic racism in the police, but there is unconscious bias. The head of the Criminal Justice Advisory Group, Chester Burrows, however, says that view is at odds with what the previous Police Commissioner, Mike Bush, said. Mr Burrows says there are serious problems with the way Māori and Pacifica people are treated, and the government is now bringing in changes that could make matters worse. We are implementing in this country the same laws that they did in the States, which saw a rapid escalation in the arrest and the incarceration of um, African Americans and Indigenous Americans. Chester Byers says armed response teams shouldn't become permanent and says fears Māori and Pacifica people have about the units are justified. Auckland City Police have launched a homicide investigation after a man was found dead in Grafton yesterday. They say early inquiries indicate he was in a vehicle with three others early in the morning. It appears they met up with another vehicle in St John's Road and several shots were fired in an altercation. The police want to hear from anyone who saw a dark-coloured Mazda in the St John's and Glen Innes areas between half past five and half past six on Monday morning. A drone has found the body of a tramper who was swept down a river in the Ruahine Forest Park in Hawke's Bay. The police were called yesterday afternoon by the man's companion saying he'd got into trouble while crossing a river near the bottom of Gold Creek Ridge Track. Bad weather and swollen river levels meant the search had to be delayed until today. It's four and a half past five. Rugby Australia wants it to exclusively host the Rugby Championship on Australian soil later this year. Annual July test matches are already cancelled due to the COVID-19 crisis, but the status of other international fixtures this year remains up in the air. Interim Rugby Australia CEO Rob Clark says they're talking with the federal government plus the New Zealand, South Africa and Argentinian unions about hosting a condensed version of the Rugby Championship. Clark says they're also keen on an expanded four-test Bledisloe Cup series against the All Blacks, with each country hosting two matches. Holden's commitment to the Supercars Championship will formally end at the completion of the 2020 season. It will mean the Red Bull team, which features New Zealand driver Shane Van Ginsbergen, will line up in a different brand of car from 2021. That's the news. More freedom from lockdown restrictions on the way. It's our view, and I'll be raising with the Cabinet, that we should bring forward our consideration of the alert levels to the 8th of June um, cabinet meeting. But will it come soon enough? I'd sort of ask the question, what's wrong with today? Um, businesses are going to the wall on a daily basis. Meanwhile, the US descends further into chaos. I want, you know, everybody to be peaceful right now, but people are torn and hurt because they're tired of seeing black men die. Breaking international and national news. Morning report weekdays from 6 on air and online. Now the short forecast from meet service to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Taranaki, including Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Tau Maranui and Taupo. Mainly fine tonight, rain spreading from the north tomorrow, briefly heavy. For the remainder of the North Island, fine spells, cloud increasing later tomorrow with scattered rain in the evening. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller and Northern Westland, mostly fine today. The odd shower about Buller and Northern Westland, becoming cloudy tomorrow with rain from the afternoon, possibly heavy. For the remainder of Westland and Fiordland, periods of rain 
rain possibly heavy. Canterbury fine apart from areas of coastal cloud, scattered rain tomorrow evening. Otago and Southland fine with high cloud. Chatham Islands, periods of rain today, low cloud and drizzle tomorrow. You're listening to RNZ National. It's coming up to seven minutes past five. Thanks, Susana, and welcome to Checkpoint. I'm Lisa Owen. President Trump has threatened to mobilise the military to silence protesters who have been demonstrating for a seventh night in cities across the United States. George Floyd's death has sent demonstrators onto the streets, crying out for justice and an end to police brutality. The president has responded by telling governors to get more aggressive or he'll send troops in. Our World Watch reporter Annabelle Reid has more. My fellow Americans... Declaring himself an ally of peaceful protesters, President Trump spoke this morning as police deployed tear gas on protesters outside the White House. I am taking immediate presidential action to stop the violence and restore security and safety in America. A presidential promise from the Commander-in-Chief that if they continue, protesters will feel the full force of the US military. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. Demonstrators were tear gassed outside the White House to clear a path for the president to cross the road and have a photo taken, holding up a Bible outside a church. Far from a call for calm on the seventh night of nationwide protests, governors were told by the president to dominate those demonstrating. Something the governor of Illinois says is just fanning the flames of hatred on the streets across the country. The fact is that he should stay out of our business. We are working hard in the state of Illinois to bring down tensions. Um, and look, he's every day he has inflamed racial tension. For a week now, the US has been gripped by demonstrations stemming from the death of George Floyd, who died in police custody. He begged for his life as a white officer knelt on his neck. Some protests have turned violent. There's been looting. Buildings have been set on fire. Standing in the same spot his brother died, Terence Floyd urged protesters to keep the peace. So if I'm not over here wilding out, if I'm not over here blowing up stuff, Come on. if I'm not over here messing up my community, Come on. then what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all doing nothing! Because that's not going to bring my brother back at all. An independent autopsy released today concluded Mr Floyd died of asphyxia. Dr Michael Baden says he believes it's clear police were responsible for Mr Floyd's death. We take everything we have into consideration. The forensic autopsy starts at the scene. In this instance, the video tells you what the scene is. The video is real. Those multiple videos show pressure that can cause death. However, that finding directly contradicts an autopsy carried out by a county medical examiner, which linked to an underlying medical condition. The officer charged with George Floyd's killing will appear in court next week. No charges have yet been laid against the other three involved. Tonight, 40 US cities have curfews in place. The president's words and threats doing nothing to quell the palpable anger on the streets. For Checkpoint, Annabelle Reid. An activist from Black Lives Matter says riots across America following the death of George Floyd George Floyd, are an uprising born out of 400 years of oppression and white Americans wouldn't stay quiet if it was happening to them. The unarmed black man died when a white police officer pressed his knee against his neck for several minutes. George Floyd begged to be released, but he wasn't. Now, as you heard in a speech from the White House Rose Garden today, Donald Trump warned if individual states don't mobilise all civilian and military military resources to end the lawlessness, he will do it for them, quickly solving the problems, he says. But Hawk Newsom from the Greater New York chapter of Black Lives Matter says protesters have reached their tipping point. Black people here are angry and they're upset. Not just the killing of George Floyd, but for 400 years of oppression. Let's be clear, this wasn't an act last week 
this is a compl- compilation of so much poverty, so much pain, so much injustice, and people have reached their tipping point. And what what do people do when they don't have a voice? They riot. If this were white Americans that this were happening to, they would never sit down. They would never march peaceful, peacefully. You want to talk about uh, things going up in smoke, hopes and dreams going up in smoke. The Bronx has a 40% high school dropout rate. And if those kids are lucky enough to make it to college, 90% of them drop out. Our hopes and dreams diminish every day. But nobody cares when it's just black people. Nobody cares until it affects them. And that's what this, these riots are doing. Because for the first time I've ever seen, people are not just destroying their community. They're going into white communities and burning down buildings. They're going in they're going in Minnesota. They built burned down a precinct. Like the this is an uprising. This is an uprising. And you know, some people say it's violent, but I don't see people killing police officers. I don't they say it's race based violence, but half of the people out there are white. So your president has spoken today and he said all Americans are sickened and revolted by what's happened to George Floyd. And he says his administration is committed to justice for George and George's family. Do you believe that? I believe that that's the right thing to say politically. Um he might have a shred of decency, right? And and he may have seen this happen and wanted change. However, last year on July 17th, Black Lives Matter in, of Greater New York took a bus to the Department of Justice and said, tomorrow, the statute of limitations will expire for the Department of Justice, Donald Trump's Department of Justice, to prosecute the cop that killed Eric Garner. They refused to prosecute that cop. And that was the first I can't breathe case. There was a man named Andrew Kearse who said, I can't breathe 11 times as he laid dying in the back of a police car. There was a man named David Dungay, who's an Aboriginal man and who was an ad- Aboriginal man in Australia, who said, I can't breathe 11 times as prison guards kneeled on him the same way that these officers kneeled on George Floyd. The problem is, I don't believe in words. I believe in action. And their actions compelled me to believe that they do not care about black people in America, and in many cases, in America, and in many cases, abroad. The government, your government, has dispatched, well, is dispatching thousands and thousands, to use your president's words, of heavily armed police onto the streets. And maintains that he's going to quell the protests and the violence. Is that going to help at all? To be perfectly honest, people feel like they're risking death every day. There's no such thing as saying that people are heavily armed. All it takes is one gun and one bullet to end a black life. And we see this way too often when a police officer shoots an unarmed black person. So for him to make this threat, this is what we face every day as black people in America. Do you see it as a threat, Hawk? Do you see those words as a threat? Um, yes, but we see th- we are threatened every day, right? Policing in this country was a pandemic before the COVID pandemic. But now you're telling us that we can be found guilty, no crime whatsoever, and we can come in contact with a police officer, and he can be judge, jury, and executioner, and you won't do anything about it? After all these, the the past five years we've been marching, it's been Black Lives Matter, it's a slap in the face that a police officer still feels that he can get away with this type of behavior. Okay, and the government has done nothing to change. 
So what needs to happen now immediately, and obviously more needs to happen long term, but right now, what's needed? We need to pass a bill, Black Lives Matter Greater New York proposed, called the I Can't Breathe Act. If a police officer hears someone say, I can't breathe, or witnesses someone in medical distress, and they do not render assistance to said person, and that person suffers an injury, then that police officer will face a Class A felony. If that person dies, then the officer will be charged with murder. Okay, that's that's what we, that's an immediate need. So only one officer has been charged in relation to George's death. What should happen with the other three, at least? The charge that the officer faced is a cupcake charge. It's murder in the third degree. A lot of people don't notice about me, but I have a legal education. I went to law school before becoming a full-time activist. And the murder three charge is not serious whatsoever. If prosecuted, I'd wager that this officer might face 10 to 12 years in jail. Um, there was an officer in, in Texas who went into the, this black man's house and she, she thought he was a burglar in his own house and she shot him and murdered him and was found guilty and they only gave her 10 years. So um, right now they need to uh, they need to prosecute the other officers involved in the death of George Floyd. What do you make of all the people who were well present when George Floyd was being knelt on by the officer and repeatedly saying he couldn't breathe? There are a lot of people around who were watching, witnessing that. Some of them filming, and I know it's hard to intervene. Do you have anything to say to bystanders? I know that the police are the police, and you're taught that the police are heroes. You're taught that the people, the police are here to respect and to protect you. But what the police in America have shown us is that they are your enemy and that they will kill you. So if you see someone being murdered by the police, you should intervene because the politicians won't protect you and the other the politicians won't protect this person and the other police won't protect that person so you have to take it upon yourself and risk potentially your life to save your brother or your sister's life we cannot stand back and watch our people be murdered anymore And that was Hawk Newsom from the Greater New York chapter of Black Lives Matter. Meanwhile, nationwide protests attended by hundreds of people here over the weekend have drawn political condemnation for flouting Level 2 rules, but there's little appetite for prosecutions. Deputy Prime Minister and New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters is pushing hard for the police to take action, saying that organisers were responsible for a large-scale breach of the mass gatherings and physical distancing rules. The view of many at Parliament is while the protests did fly in the face of the rules, they were motivated by passion and a frustration at what's happened to George Floyd in the United States. Our political editor, Jane Patterson, filed this report. Black lives matter! Black lives matter! Images of the protests in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch make it clear social distancing rules were thrown out the window prompting a call for prosecutions from Mr Peters. Unless we're going to level one, why is there sort of one law for some people, a different law for the mass majority of the five million New Zealanders who have done so much to bring us to where we are? The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has sympathy for why the protests started, but not how they were held. I understand the sentiment, but I cannot condone the breaking of the rules. Any decisions about prosecutions, she says, are not for her. I haven't intervened on any of the police's decisions around enforcement, whether or not it was um, someone who was out and about at level four who shouldn't have been, or, or a business who was open that shouldn't have been. Those are decisions that are always for the police. The police minister, Stuart Nash, also takes a dim view of the protests while deferring to the police. They will determine whether anyone's prosecuted or not. I understand they're not going to. They have taken a graduated response to anyone in any situation throughout Alert Level 4, 3 and 2. In terms of people who break the rules, my understanding is they undertook that same graduated response with regard to this. 
MPs from Labour's Māori caucus don't believe the organisers should be punished. We understand the passion, the anger from yesterday, but we all have to obey the law too. We're asking all groups to respect the law that is in place because we're trying to protect the health of people. I don't think there's a point in trying to throw the book at everybody, but we do need to be clear, not only to the organisers, but to everyone. Nationals Police spokesperson Brett Hudson is also sympathetic. The cause of the protest is noble. We all uh, stand alongside and behind people that decry racism and that sort of um, those sorts of goings on. But we're still we're told in level two, so we are all expected to social distance. We are expected to maintain small gatherings. But he stopped short of calling for prosecutions. To call yesterday's events regrettable is perhaps an understatement, but it's over to the police what they do about that. The Director-General of Health, Dr Ashley Bloomfield, has given some advice to people who attended the protests. People should take a cautious approach if they feel at risk and seek medical advice. But he says with no evidence of community transmission, self-quarantining for 14 days is not required. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Jane Patterson. And New Zealand could leap to Alert Level 1 as early as next week, with the Prime Minister bringing forward the date at which ministers will make that crucial call. On Monday, Cabinet will look at lowering the COVID-19 restrictions to near normality. But for those in opposition, and indeed even some in government, it is not soon enough. Here's our Deputy Political Editor, Craig McCulloch. Today marks 11 days straight with the news New Zealanders want to hear. Today there are again no new cases of COVID-19 to report. Once again there are no new cases of COVID-19. There are no new cases of COVID-19 in New Zealand. But as the good news days grow, so too does the pressure to relax restrictions, namely the social distancing requirements, leaving many restaurants at low capacity. New Zealand should be in level one now. We should be at level one or zero. We should be at level one right now. Today some small Small success for those opposition MPs. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern bringing forward the date at which ministers will consider that move to level one, citing the country's better than expected results in its battle with COVID-19. We have the enviable situation of having choices and we could well be in a position to move to level one even earlier than planned. Indeed, a full fortnight earlier, the country could be in level one from Thursday next week. In the meantime, though... The rules remain. The rules are there for a reason. The rules are there to ensure people are kept safe and well and that we don't go backwards. But Winston Peters thinks the rules are now redundant. The Deputy Prime Minister has been vocal in his calls. Like National, he wants the country at level one now. <laughs> Mr Peters' party, New Zealand First, today released an advert with footage of the weekend's Black Lives Matter protests. It reads... We don't see much social distancing. Do you? If we're going to have that, then why aren't we in lockdown one? And that stark difference of opinion has been seized on by the opposition. National's Todd Muller says the two parties must get on the same page, that their mixed messages are confusing the public. Over the last few days, we have seen a government that is completely fractured and entirely divergent. From time to time, the Deputy Prime Minister and I will take a different view and colleagues around the Cabinet table will take a different view. But ultimately, we have formed consensus. There is a balanced position here that is about making sure sure we do not slide backwards, that would be the worst thing for our economy possible. The Prime Minister will release more details about the next stage in the next few days. She says it will be near normality, but the border will remain closed. Cabinet will next meet on Monday. If the good news keeps coming, it could be level one 48 hours later. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Craig McCulloch. It is 26 minutes after five and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. We're keen for your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening. You can text us about when you think we should go to level one. Uh, you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Now let's change tack entirely now and go shopping. Countdown is giving staff a $10 million stake in the company. The supermarket giant announced today more than 14,000 staff would receive Woolworths Group shares as a thank you for working through lockdown. Kitty Hannafin is Countdown's spokesperson and she joins me now. Kitty, what are they going to get exactly? Um, so our team, oh, kia ora, by the way, nice to talk to you. Um, our team are going uh, have been are going to be given um, a shares in our company. So that's across the group, Australia and New Zealand, is not only recognition for the incredible work they've done over the last 
few months, but also um, as an acknowledgement that our team are, you know, should have a stake in our future and our future success. So each individual worker gets what? Um, 750 Australian dollars worth of shares. So uh, today that's about 21 shares. The shares are about $35 uh, at the moment, but a few months ago they were $45. So they fluctuate a bit, but it's 750 Australian dollars worth of shares. And so realistically, what does that give them in terms of any power or influence? Well, they get a, they get um, dividends immediately. They also get voting rights. Um, but I guess it's more of a symbolic, you know, a ownership of a little bit of our company. And I think um, that feels very powerful. And I know that our response today from our team feels like that as well. I guess so many people have been with us for so long that they really do feel like they're part of our DNA. And now to give them a say in our future and, and a stake in our success just feels like the right gesture. It's not a gesture. It's a, you know the right thing to do. So that ten million dollars of shares amounts to what percentage? What percentage of what? Sorry, of the shares, you know, influence in the company. So collectively, staff will own oh, how much? Oh, no, sorry, Lisa, I don't. Oh, I don't know. That's a good. Sorry, I don't know that one. Okay, so within your workforce, is everybody getting them? No, so it's uh, it's for our permanent uh, team members who who don't otherwise get a bonus. So some you know some people in our business get bonuses and some don't. So, so this is the fourteen and a half thousand people who work for us don't currently get a, a bonus, but are, are permanent staff members of ours. And if and that's so for full time and part time. So full time get the seven fifty, and the part time get the pro rata. And and so who are these people? Are they checkout operators? Are they shelf yeah, stackers? Exactly. I mean, give us a bit of a taste. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's our checkout operators, our online pickers. These are the people who pick your groceries for you when you get them at home. They're our night fill. They're the people who work in our DCs. They're the front line of our business. They're the you know, hearts and souls of the face of our business. So you said that you had some positive feedback about the anu- announcement. Did, were they given a choice, like, for example, whether they could get <laughs> just 750 bucks and a bonus or whether they had to take the shares? No, they they haven't got a choice. Although, of course, when they leave countdown, they can sell the shares. Um, they are theirs, you know. They are there. The shares are theirs to do as they please with. Um, but no, um, we as you as you know, Lisa, we gave um, a bonus during the lockdown. We've been giving our team ten percent of their groceries for several months now, and it's going to continue as a continued sort of thank you. And the shares are just a sort of added extra as another way to say thanks. And um, and we need you, and we want you um, to help us in our future success here in New Zealand as we sort of help our economy recover. And I think it's right that our team have a, have a part in that, a financial part in that. So is there any obligation to hold on to them for a certain amount of time or, or what's the deal? Yes, um, because of how the Australian Stock Exchange works, um, our team um, are required to hold on to them for three years. But if you leave, you can sell them immediately. So um, you're not locked in with us. You don't have to stay with us for three years. If you leave, you can sell them. But otherwise, if you stay with our business, then you need to keep them for three years, just like you would like your KiwiSaver fund. So just to be clear, if they leave the company before the three years is up, they're entitled to sell their shares? Absolutely, yep, absolutely. Is there any catch here? I don't think so. I keep thinking it's because I'm so proud of it. I'm so super chuffed. I don't know. No, it's it's pretty cool. No, I, there isn't a catch, I don't think. Is there? Do you think you should you'd know more than me, I think? We appreciate I'm your time, Kitty. <laughs> So $10 okay. million dollars worth, of, worth of shares going to some of the countdown workers. There are 14,500 countdown workers. They'll get about 21 shares each. And coming up on Checkpoint on RNZ National, as the death of George Floyd prompts worldwide protests, our own police armed response trial has come under fire. But the minister maintains they are not systemically racist, a systemically racist organisation. And an Auckland cat owner turns sleuth after discovering her dead cat was literally thrown away by a council contractor. And do you walk and talk? A Japanese city proposes a ban on using smartphones while walking. We would love your feedback, especially if you were among the protesters out yesterday. Don't forget you can text us on 2101, you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, Facebook us, Checkpoint or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. It's time now for the headlines with Susanna. An activist from Black Lives Matter says protests across the US are born out of 400 years of oppression. The US President Donald Trump has threatened to send in the military if state governors are not able to quell the violence. Hawk Newsom from the Greater New York Chapter of Black Lives Matter told Checkpoint protesters have reached their tipping point.
The Prime Minister is downplaying any tensions in the coalition relationship, saying from time to time Cabinet members will take a different view. The Government will now look at relaxing restrictions as early as next week, but the Deputy Prime Minister wants it to happen now for the sake of business. The Police Minister says there is no systemic racism in the police, but there is unconscious bias. However, the head of the Criminal Justice Advisory Group, Chester Burrows, says there are serious problems with the way Māori and Pacifica people are treated, and new government legislation could make matters worse. A bus driver's union is accusing one of the country's biggest operators of failing to pass on COVID-19 payments to its staff who are unable to work due to the pandemic. NZ Bus has been funded to continue paying 100% of drivers' wages, but First Union says the drivers, many aged over 70, are only being paid a portion of their normal wage, with the company pocketing the difference. The government has announced which industries will benefit from its $320 million targeted training fund. The money announced in last month's budget covers the cost of all apprenticeships for the next two and a half years and vocational courses in specific industries. The Transport Agency is blaming a short phasing traffic light at roadworks and motorists running red lights for causing hundreds of holidaymakers to get caught for hours in the Awakino Gorge on State Highway 3 yesterday. Traffic was gridlocked for the whole afternoon. Those are the latest news headlines from RNZ National. Our next news and weather update is at six. Thanks, Susanna. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen and it's time for the business news with Nona Peltier who joins me in the studio. Hi, Nona. ANZ has found a buyer for its industrial and business finance lender, UDC. So who has snapped that up? Interestingly, it's a, ja- a Japanese bank, um, the Shinsei Bank, and it's buying UDC for $762 million, which is a pretty good price, uh, considering a couple of years ago, you might recall, that uh, ANZ did try to sell the UDC and found a buyer. It was a Chinese uh, organization, HNA Group. But they were turned down by the Overseas Investment Office Uh and said, no, don't know you guys. We're not a little bit sure about it. So, nope. So that set back ANZ. They thought maybe we should list that UDC entity, which they've been trying to sell for a while, then decided against doing that as well. So they must be pretty happy to have found a buyer for this company. And this purchase is all signed off? Uh, apparently, uh, they say that this particular buyer will satisfy the regulators. It's a Japanese bank, so it's already got, I guess, a, a quite, a, quite a lot of credibility behind it. Mm. And so there should be those kinds of questions over its background and so on won't be an issue for the Overseas Investment Office. Okay, well, Statistics has released some more data now demonstrating the economic damage caused by the pandemic. Well, what, what have you got for us, Nina? Well, I don't have any good news. Uh, <laughs> I could say that right now. Uh, but then, look, the number of new homes that were consented in April is yeah. down 17% on the year earlier, 1-7%. Uh, now, that is actually the lowest number of consents for that period in nearly nine years. So that's explained because what offices were actually open in April? Yeah, might, I was going to say, ask. is that because people aren't interested in getting a, center, a consent and pulling back from pushing ahead? Or is it just that the bureaucrats who rubber stamp everything weren't in the office? I would say that who was open? I mean, wasn't it yeah. just the whole month closed? I mean, who would have been there to do any of this work? So they might be stuck yeah. in the pipeline so somewhere. it could be bad news. Uh, It could be that it's even worse to come. It's really hard to tell with uh, the numbers that we're seeing. We know that things opened up a bit in May, and certainly there's hopeful signs for for June. So let's not get too dark about it. But, yep, these are the numbers. Uh, Now, it was only slightly down, like, in the year to February, just keeping in mind. So here's some good news. Uh, That was a uh, 45-year record number to the year ended in February, 37 1,882. So the year to the end of April is 37,180. Not so the so bigger bad. picture, not so bad. Not so the bad. Single month, mm. Not so good. Uh, also, our import prices for the um, and export prices for the first quarter, that's the first three months of this year versus the uh, quarter before, uh, that shows that our export prices took a bit of a hit. That's not surprising considering China was already in lockdown at that point. I mean, it seems like such a long time ago. But uh, I guess our listeners will know that back in in January, 
the the virus had already affected China. There was shutdowns through February and certainly from March. That affected export prices. Interestingly, it was a drop in meat prices that drove down the export prices overall. We saw lamb prices fall 10 percent and beef prices down 6%. That's in addition to a drop in log prices, which was offset somewhat by dairy products. So that's held up for us, which is a good good sign. Um, import prices, were they rose slightly in the first quarter. So overall, uh, our purchasing, which is the way you kind of like work out Export prices tell us how we are doing in the world. That fell 0.7%. Not terrible, but it's the first fall in more than a year. So that's kind of telling too. Yeah, exactly. What are the numbers looking like on the market? A good day on the market. So the top 50 index rose 1.4% today, and that's 152 points up to 11,034. Now that's better than the rest of the region, which is, uh, you're not sure which way to move with uh, some of the uncertainty around the China and US relations, but also what's going on in the United States. And of course, improvements or potential improvements with the, uh, the the ongoing pandemic. So there's a little bit of a mixture of sentiment there, but overall we outperformed that region. And, and the dollar, it's steady at 62.8 US cents, 92.4 Australian and 50.3 British pence. Thanks, Nona. That's Nona Peltier with our business news. A Māori law expert says the police minister is off the mark in saying the police is not a systemically racist organisation. Stuart Nash says while the police may have issues with unconscious bias, they aren't racist. It comes as thousands of people took to the streets yesterday to join the Black Lives Matter movement sweeping across the United States in the wake of the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. It's raised questions about the New Zealand police treatment of minority groups and the trial of American-style armed response teams. Police reporter Ben Strang has more. As protests unfolded against the treatment of black Americans by police in the United States, people were also looking closer to home. The trial of armed response teams has been a divisive issue because of the perception that it's a step towards the American-style routine arming of police officers. And when police data shows Māori and Pacifica people end up far worse off after an encounter with the police, fears are growing that if police start arming themselves, those people will have to fear for their lives as well. Stuart Nash, the police minister, acknowledged the reasons for protests throughout the country, but says New Zealand's police are not systemically racist. I think there is unconscious bias and the previous police commissioner himself did acknowledge this, but I don't think there is. My personal view, from what I have seen, is there is, I do not believe there is institutional racism. If you ask those working to reform the criminal justice system, there's no real difference between unconscious bias and systemic racism. Māori lawyer Kylie Quince, an associate professor at the Auckland University of Technology, says Mr Nash's comments are off the mark. Look, I think we can refute any claims of there not being uh, racism in the New Zealand police with their own data. So the commissioner previous to the current one, Mike Bush, came out in, in 2015 and uh, admitted unconscious bias in the New Zealand police. Data shows that Māori are far more likely, almost nine times more likely, to have a dog set upon them. And that was echoed by Chester Burrows, the former National Party MP and police officer who led the Safe and Effective Justice programme, looking at reforming the sector. There has to be an answer for why the vast majority of people who are in our justice system who come out of, come out of communities that are, that are um, overly represented by Maori Pacific people and they get locked up far more often and, and they're patrolled far more often and and then the outcomes for them are far worse than they are for Pākehā. So we need to ask, start answering those sorts of questions, and they lie, whether we want to hear it or not, they lie in contemporary um, colonialism, colonisation. So, you know, that's the, the, that's the situation. And we, we are implementing in this country the same laws that they did in the States, which saw a rapid escalation in the, um, in the arrest and the incarceration of... Um, African-Americans and Indigenous Americans. Police data shows vastly different outcomes for Māori and Pacifica people compared to Pākehā in similar situations. And one stark contrast is that of police shootings. 
In the decade since 2009, two-thirds of people shot by the police were Māori and Pacifica people. That's despite Māori and Pacifica people making up just a quarter of New Zealand's population. So why doesn't Stuart Nash think the police has an issue with systemic racism? Racism is making comments, it's a belief system, uh, whereas unconscious bias is a series of experiences that may cloud um, someone's view of certain circumstances or people. But I do not believe there is inherent racism in the police service. Isn't the result the same? Can be. But this is why the previous commissioner himself instigated uh, training for new constables to recognise unconscious bias and to deal with it. Stuart Nash had support from the president of the Police Association, Chris Carhill, in his assertion that the police isn't racist. I reject that altogether. We've got to be very careful. We can quote stats all you like about a police interaction with Māori. What it actually ignores, though, is the whole problem we have in society for these groups. And it starts right back with the health system, with the education system, and the failure of those to meet these groups. Poverty. So you can't just blame police that at the end of the chain. Regardless of whether the police is systemically racist or just unconsciously biased against minority groups, it throws up questions about the treatment Māori and Pacifica will receive if the armed response team pilots get the green light. The units were trialled in Auckland, Waikato and Christchurch and saw teams of armed police patrol the streets attending all manner of jobs. The Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, acknowledged the angst some people had with the trial. Obviously that was a decision made by the police. Um, That did not stop uh, ministers and MPs expressing concerns that they had with those trials. They were trials. They've now ceased. I know the Commissioner is waiting to make a judgement on what happens with their future and we have inputted into that in the same way that I know many communities are too. The opposition leader, Todd Muller, wouldn't pass judgement on the trial just yet, saying he wants to know what a review says. Well, I want to see the uh, evidence uh, based on the trial itself. Obviously, they had it for a period of time. They were particularly focused on the harder criminal elements of, uh, of society. Let's get uh, the feedback from the police as to how effective it was in terms of delivering against their number one objective, which is keeping New Zealanders safe. What were those harder criminal elements Mr Muller talked about? According to police data, the ARTs were used mainly for traffic stops, bail checks and basic inquiries. More than half the people they arrested didn't have a weapon. 14% of people carried a gun. Chris Carhill says the results show the teams were a big success story. New Zealand's very different than some of the other countries we've seen commentary come out of. Uh, and But the key for me is when you look at what we do know about the ARTs is that no one was shot by an ART patrol throughout the trial and in fact all incidents dealt with were, were resolved peacefully so that's got to be a very much a positive. Chester Burrows does not agree. When that was put on the, um, I've forgotten who it was now but one of the deputy commissioners basically she said well we can't just have them sitting around doing nothing. Well you know, and that's the, that's the tension. If you feel you need to have an ART, then you're going to have them in a sort of a SWAT type room where they're waiting for the next armed incident to blow up. Now, in the states where these sorts of things happen on a daily basis, especially around the big metro areas, maybe you can justify something like that. But you can't justify having it uh, when the vast majority of the work they're doing is just normal routine police work. While Jacinda Ardern and Stuart Nash are opposed to general arming of police, Chris Carhill says police association members support it. Chester Burrows says it's a slippery slope to be heading along and there's already evidence of things going wrong with lesser weapons in New Zealand. What bothers me is that we're, by, by dishing out a whole lot more tools so that a policeman looks like an electrician as he walks into an incident with everything hanging off his belt, short batons and long batons and all the rest of it, what we're doing is we're, we're moving away from the interpersonal skills that police always had, which prevented them from having to carry those things in the past. The police's review of the ARTs will be completed by the end of the month when it will be reviewed by politicians. For Checkpoint, Ben Strang.
It is 14 minutes to six. I'm Lisa Owen and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Let us know what you make of the armed response team and your views on its future. That's being assessed at the moment. Is it a slippery slope or do we need them on a permanent basis? You can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or send us an email, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Campers, trampers and Coromandel residents were all ringing out their mops today after a deluge of prolonged heavy rain over the weekend. More than half a metre of rain lashed the region over 48 hours. Civil defence assessments of any damage to rural properties are continuing as farmers, including one whose highland cow was washed away, and businesses clean up. Chen Liu reports. Fiti Farm Park in Fedianga lets families feed and pet its 150 animals. Its managers were anticipating financial recovery after long drought and the COVID-19 lockdown. But on the very first day of their reopening, a torrential downpour smashed their plans. Ronnie James is the owner. It wasn't actually forecast to be that much rain on Saturday night. Uh, we experienced about 250 mils of rain, which is a lot. They have experienced quite a few floods before, but nothing like this. The place basically was flooded. All the fences have been ripped out. Um, I mean, even a big Scottish Highland cow was washed a kilometre down downstream. Ms James says, fortunately, the animals are all safe and only one hen was missing. But debris has been strewn everywhere and their car park out in the front is half a metre deep in salt. She says the clean-up and repairs are going to take quite a while. Even though the winter is quiet time for us, we still get customers. And if we can make a few dollars here and there by a few people coming through each day rather than none, then that's why we stay open all year round. And so there is school holidays coming up in July, but that's only a month away. So we don't even know if we'll be able to reopen then. Dirk Sealing is a dairy farmer also in Ferianga. We've had um, some flooding. Uh, we've had quite a few block culverts and some slips, uh, mostly minor slips, but one uh, quite major slip just starting to form, which is a bit of a long-term problem. He has been busy cleaning since yesterday and also thinking about how to prevent more serious slips from happening. On the, on the hillsides, um, there's been slumping. So, you know, you look at what you can do about that, uh, planting trees, um, but then, of course, you have to fence it off with stock as well. In Auckland, Water Care Chief Executive Ravine Jadoram says the city could still use more rain. The city's water storage levels increased by just over 1% at the weekend to 44.6%, still well below the normal average of 77%. He says with the forecast drier than normal spring, water restrictions could be in place for a longer period of time. I'm happy that we had the rain uh, because it's better than no rain. But the key message is we are not out of the situation. So I don't want Auckland just to suddenly feel, oh, the problem's gone away. The problem is still here. Motehoraka o te ahiahi nei kuo chan leo aho. And let's do a little bit of your feedback now on moving to level one. A few of you have got in touch to say the science is absolutely clear. It needs two incubation periods of 14 days to be 95% sure that the virus is eliminated. Winston and the Nats are just playing politics by demanding level one now. They are appealing to the people who do not understand the science or do not care. Winston Peters... Uh, of course wants to show his voter base that he is his own man and that has something different from the government to offer. That is from Peter. Uh, someone else says the decision of when to move to alert level one should not be based on popular public opinion and the opinion of a single marginal politician like Peter's. It should be based on robust and well-informed science and modelling with a focus on the common good. So why is RNZ conducting a survey of public opinion? Maybe because our politicians are influenced by that and Someone else says, uh, Kia ora, Lisa, on level one, the actions of approximately 0.006% of our population who attended yesterday's protests is not a sound justification to go to level one. As always, it should continue to be based on scientific advice. Namahi Rachel. Hashtag NZ Lives Matter. And someone else says, going to level one, what about over 70s who continue to observe level two protocols but let working people back into the economies? New Zealanders have made huge economic sacrifices to save lives and it is older people who have been victims. We need 
need to be helpful in return. I am 79 and, and extremely grateful to our country. Cheers. Thanks for all your feedback. OK, well, there are calls tonight for a thorough investigation into the contractors supposed to recover the bodies of pests killed on Auckland roads. Now, this comes after revelations a worker threw a dead cat into a ditch instead of taking it to a welfare centre so it could be returned to its owner. And the remains of what appeared to be other animals were also found at the site. After Rebecca Jolly discovered her beloved cat Muffin had been killed by a car, she contacted Fulton Hogan to get the body back for a proper farewell. First off, she was told her mutilated cat was thrown off a cliff by a worker. The plot took a number of twists, but GPS coordinates from a Fulton Hogan truck eventually revealed the true story. I asked Rebecca Jelly what Fulton Hogan initially told her about Muffin's whereabouts. It ended up that they believed the employee threw her off a cliff, as they said, um, which we weren't too impressed with. Um, we dug a little deeper and it turns out she had been dumped in a ditch not far from their offices. So you went out with the team from Fulton Hogan, did you, to try and locate her? What happened at the first spot you went to? So the first spot was um, about 30 kilometres or nearly 30 kilometres from Muffin's final um, resting spot. And um, we went out there with a crew from Fulton Hogan and we're busy looking down this cliff face and unfortunately the employee who was responsible wasn't engaging in the search in any way, sort of standing off and not helping and that sort of just left us feeling quite uneasy about the situation and sort of not sure what really was the truth at this point. So the worker originally said where you were searching was where he had dumped Muffin's body? Correct, yes. And what had he said about the condition of your cat? He said that um, the reason for this was that Muffin was in two pieces. Was that true? No, it wasn't. We recovered her body eventually intact. When you were told that, how did you react at the time? Well, quite angrily, I would say, given we had had a number of sightings to um, confirm that she was not mangled in any way, she wasn't disfigured, and so that inconsistency just, it wasn't a good feeling. So you were being told stories? We were, exactly. How did you find her in the end? We just pushed and pushed and pushed. Um, it turns out my, my little brother turned up at their offices and basically said, I, we want the cat back and I'm not leaving till we get it. Um, finally, we did get her back by asking to review their GPS tracking in the truck. And this is where they found actually there was a site near their offices where she was actually dumped in the end. So just so we understand this properly, the GPS on the truck that the worker had used led you to a particular site where the truck had been stopped. Yes, well, it, it led Fulton Hogan there and they disclosed this location to us. And who found Muffin? Um, Fulton Hogan's crew. They went out there to collect her and bring her back to us. So how have they explained all of this to you? Not with much clarity at the moment. Um, it very much seems to be channelled on this one particular individual, but that's definitely not how we see this issue at all. So how do you see it? We see this as a loophole in the current system that is being exploited. We understand that companies can have one or two bad eggs, but in order for something like this to happen, obviously the protocol has not been supervised properly and there are ways to avoid doing the job correctly. So what are they supposed to do when they find a pet or an animal that's deceased on the road? So this, again, seems to be something that is unclear. Speaking to Fulton Hogan directly, they said that protocol is, regardless of the pet's condition, they get taken to the welfare centre, who scan them for a chip, they hold them and they try to reunite them with their family. Again, talking with council, we're sort of getting a different story. So to be honest right now, we're not sure. What do you want to happen now? I want to see there to be a change in the process. I want to make sure that there's a protocol in place that people know to follow and that if there is a job logged with the council that it's followed up to the point that okay this pet has been collected and it has been taken to the shelter there's no sort of lost in the middle lost in translation no one knows where it is business anymore how how worried are you that this well muffin situation is not a one-off 
very concerned. Um, we had been assured by Fulton Hogan numerous times that this is definitely a one-off situation. As soon as I posted my story online, there are a lot of comments suggesting that this is not the case. And in fact, it's been going on for years. Um, in addition to this, finding animal bones at Muffin's final dumping site also raises concerns. So tell us about that. What else was found where Muffin was found? So we went to that site after we um, found out about the location because we wanted to see whether or not there was anything else there. Um, we found a rib cage that when we passed the photos on to a couple of vets, think it looks like a dog. We found um, hip implants, which looked to be also from a dog, you know, and you think that somebody who spent, you know, nearly $30,000 on a pet isn't going to just dump it on the side of the road. We found numerous um, cats, unfortunately, there and just lots of little animal bones, which is really distressing. And what does that make you think, what you found? Of course, there's no evidence, obviously, to directly link it to Fulton Hogan, but the fact that it's the same location just leads me to suspect possibly this is a much wider issue and this is sort of just them cutting corners and not following through on the process properly. And so you did get Muffin back. You were persistent and you got your cat back. What did you do? We got her back and we've got her cremated um, and... For us, it's just such a relief, even though we're going through this time where we're very upset, a relief to have a home and have her with us and with our family again. It's just so important for us. And that was Rebecca Jelly. And uh, we did ask Fulton Hogan on to give us an interview, but they declined to speak to us. They did give us a statement, however. They say the actions of the individual concerned are contrary to common decency and our company values and uh, procedures around how we recover the bodies of pets. And we are currently dealing with the individual in an appropriate manner. They go on to say we have expressed our sincere apologies to the family for the distress they have been through and have also reiterated to our teams the duty of care we have when collecting deceased animals from the roading network. Let's get to some of your feedback now. Uh, regarding the protest yesterday and concerns about a lack of social distancing and the breach of, well, numbers restrictions at Level 2, Alex has got in touch to say, I marched yesterday. When I arrived a quarter of an hour before the rally was due to start, the organisers were asking people to physically distance and hold their bubbles if this was possible. In the next 20 minutes, thousands arrived, taking everybody by surprise, I think, says Alex. Someone else says, I condemn, condemn the George Floyd protests in Auckland. We have so many issues in our own country, yet we get a big protest like this over another nation's issues, sick to death of the outsourcing of America's political drama in our country. Uh, Frank has got in touch to say, Hi Lisa, it is a bit rich for Winston Peters to be condemning the Black Lives Matter protest marches when he advocates opening our borders to China, Australia, etc., which still have the COVID-19 virus. I suspect he opposes the protests and is using the pandemic as a cloak of acceptable criticism. Thanks for getting in touch, uh, Frank. And some of you, uh, more of you getting in touch about Level 1, the potential move to Level 1. Remembering the Prime Minister says they'll consider it at Cabinet next Monday and we could move as early as next week, depending on what the evidence is. Maureen says... Level one is fine as long as we don't open the borders. Sobering reading from the UK and other countries about the ongoing heart, lung and vascular damage to people in their 20s through to their 60s. This virus is not something we want to deal with again. Sorry, tourist companies, but a sick country is a sick economy. And Maureen says Winston needs to bunk off or shut up. Judith has also got in touch to say the end of the world to stick is not the end of the world to stick to two cycles, 28 days in level two. Let's not risk two months of hard work, Judith says. Hold off going to level one. And on shares for countdown staff, this person says, thank you, Kerry. Please pay your staff the living wage rather than the shares. 
RNZ News at 6. Nga mahi nui ko Susana Layata with DNA. An activist from Black Lives Matter says protests across the US are born out of 400 years of oppression. The president has threatened to send in the military if state governors are not able to quell the violence. It's the seventh night of protests sparked by the death of African-American man George Floyd at the hands of police. Hawk Newsom from the Greater New York Chapter of Black Lives Matter told Checkpoint protesters have reached their tipping point. This is an uprising. This is an uprising. And, you know, some people say it's violent, but I don't see people killing police officers. I don't, they say it's race-based violence, but half of the people out there are white. Hawk Newsom from the group Black Lives Matter. Donald Trump has been criticised for posing for photos outside a church with a Bible just moments after police used tear gas to clear away protesters outside the White House. The BBC's Peter Bowes reports. There's been an angry reaction certainly from the bishop, uh, the Episcopal Church in Washington responsible for that particular church, saying that she was outraged, as she put it, that the president had chosen to go there to use it as a prop for political gain. She particularly outraged that there were demonstrators in that area who were cleared by uh, the police using tear gas in the moments before the president went to the church. And she was particularly angry about that. She said she hadn't been given any advance warning about it. In fact, she first knew that it was happening when she saw it on television. Peter Bowes reporting. There have been violent scenes in New York City where looters attacked shops in downtown Manhattan just before an overnight curfew came into force. The Prime Minister is downplaying any tensions in the coalition relationship with New Zealand First continuing to call for an immediate move to Level 1. Cabinet will now look at relaxing restrictions as early as next week, but the Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters wants it to happen now. Here's our political editor Jane Patterson. Jacinda Ardern and Mr Peters have been openly talking about the differing views around the Cabinet table, but she says ministers did reach consensus on the revised timetable. Ms Ardern had no criticism of her deputy when asked if he's been acting in good faith, saying his public comments came as no surprise. He says the relationship is based on respect and remains good. This is about a fundamental difference of opinion, but expect to see New Zealand First increasingly look to mark out its own ground away from Labour ahead of the election. From Parliament, Jane Patterson. A Māori Associate Professor of Law says there is no doubt that there is racism in the police. It's in response to the Police Minister Stuart Nash saying New Zealand police are not systemically racist. But the Associate Professor of Law at AUT, Kylie Quince, says the police's own data proves otherwise. Look, I think we can refute any claims of there not being uh, racism in the New Zealand police with their own data. So the commissioner previous to the current one came out in, in 2015 and uh, admitted unconscious bias in the New Zealand police. Data shows that Māori are far more likely, almost nine times more likely, to have a dog set upon them. Kylie Quince from AUT. Hawke's Bay had nearly half its monthly rainfall yesterday, but officials say it's not enough to break the big drought. On the first day of June, rain pelted down in the region, up to 150 millimetres at most. Hawke's Bay Regional Council's air scientist, Kathleen Kozinyak, says it's much more than normal. Just in this one day of June, we're already at um, about 40% of the region's June rainfall, and in particular the Hiratonga Plains and the Ruatanafa Plains are sitting there almost 60% of their June rainfall just after one, one and a bit day. Dr Kozinyak says it's not a drought breaker but should bring grass growth that's expected to stay warm until Friday when a showery southwesterly is forecast. The Transport Agency is blaming a short phasing traffic light at roadworks and motorists running red lights for causing hundreds of holidaymakers to get caught for hours in the Awakino Gorge on State Highway 3 yesterday. Traffic was gridlocked for the whole afternoon. It's four and a half past six. Rugby Australia wants to exclusively host the Rugby Championship 
Championship on Australian soil later this year. Annual July test matches are already cancelled due to the COVID-19 crisis. But the status of other international fixtures this year remain up in the air. The head of Interim Rugby Australia says they're talking with the federal government, plus the New Zealand, South Africa and Argentinian unions, about hosting a condensed version of the Rugby Championship. Rob Clark says they're also keen on an expanded four-test Bledisloe Cup series against the All Blacks, with each country hosting two matches. Boxing great Floyd Mary Mayweather... Floyd Mayweather is offering to cover the funeral expenses for George Floyd, the 46-year-old African-American man whose death while in police custody in Minneapolis prompted protests across the world. The former five-division world champions promotional company Mayweather Productions confirmed the offer on Twitter and several local media reports say the family have accepted. Though, uh, that's the news. I'm Catherine Ryan. Tomorrow on Nine to Noon, New Zealand Rugby Chief Executive Mark Robinson on the future for the game, from grassroots to the All Blacks. Yuat Alak, whose eyewitness account of civil war in Sudan proves the pen is mightier than the gun. And Wellington Paranormal's Karen O'Leary plays favourites from her debut album of children's songs from her band Fun and Funner. Join me on Nine to Noon on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from its service to midnight. Tomorrow, Northland to Taranaki, including Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Domaranui and Taupo. Mainly fine tonight. Rain spreading from the north tomorrow, briefly heavy. For the remainder of the North Island, fine spells. Cloud increasing later tomorrow with scattered rain in the evening. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller and Northern Westland. Mostly fine tonight. The odd shower about Buller and Northern Westland. Becoming cloudy tomorrow with rain from the afternoon, possibly heavy. For the remainder of Westland and for your Broadland, periods of rain possibly heavy. Canterbury, fine apart from areas of coastal cloud and scattered rain tomorrow evening. Otago and Southland, fine with high cloud. Chatham Islands, periods of rain tonight, low cloud and drizzle tomorrow. You're with RNZ National. It's coming up to seven minutes past six. Thanks, Susanna. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. Let's return to the United States now, where US President Donald Trump has de- today declared himself a president of law and order and threatened to deploy the military to cities across the country to end a week of civil unrest. George Floyd's death has officially been declared a homicide by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner and his family commission autopsy revealed he suffered a cardiopulmonary arrest while being restrained by law enforcement officers. Just one officer, Derek Chauvin, has been charged over his death so far, sparking nationwide protests, destruction and looting throughout the weekend. Chris Dignam from Reuters has more. These are not acts of peaceful protests. These are acts of domestic terror. President Donald Trump ordered the deployment of thousands of heavily armed soldiers and law enforcement to halt violent protests in the U.S. Capitol on Monday and vowed to do the same in other cities if their leaders fail to regain control of the streets. Mayors and governors must establish an overwhelming law enforcement presence until the violence has been quelled. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property, of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. As Trump spoke in the White House Rose Garden, blasts from stun grenades could be heard blocks away. The brutal death of George Floyd. As police on horseback dispersed a peaceful protest using tear gas and rubber bullets as well. I am your president of law and order. After his brief remarks, Trump walked out of the White House surrounded by dozens of security personnel to St. John's Episcopal Church, which was damaged by fire during protests Sunday night, and stood in front of the boarded up windows of the church, where he held up a Bible for cameras to see, but took no questions from reporters before walking back to the White House. the military against U.S. citizens. Earlier on Monday, Trump had berated the country's governors over the phone, calling them weak. Most of you are weak. And urged them to crack down on the violence and looting that has engulfed America's cities. You have to dominate. If you don't dominate, you're wasting your time. They're going to run over you. You're going to look like a bunch of jerks. You have to dominate. Trump also threatened to, quote, activate U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr and Defense Secretary Mark Esper, who was also on the call, echoed Trump's direction to, quote, dominate. I agree. We need to dominate the battle space. I think the sooner that you mass and 
dominate the battle space, the quicker uh, this dissipates and, uh, and we can get back to a, 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 the right normal. Curfews were in effect in Washington and cities across the country on Monday, but as night fell, protests nationwide continued to spread. And just a short while ago, I spoke to CNN correspondent Daryl Forges in Minneapolis, ground zero for the protests, where a few days ago, his colleague Omar Jimenez and his camera crew were arrested by riot police while reporting live on air and despite clearly displaying media credentials and complying with police instructions. Tonight's curfew has passed, but some protesters are still on the street with a police helicopter buzzing overhead. So far, only one of the four officers connected to the death of George Floyd has been charged. Daryl spoke to me just metres away from where George Floyd had his neck knelt on by police. I asked him what's happening to the other officers involved. Derek uh, Chauvin, the police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck, um, is in custody. He was supposed to face a judge today, but he will now face a judge sometime next week. Now, as for the other three officers, according to uh, the Minnesota Attorney General, Keith Ellison, uh, Those three officers, they have not been charged yet, but they're expecting to have charges coming up on those three sometime in the very near future. What has been the reaction to President Trump's comments today? They were very strong, talking about law enforcement, putting armed military on the streets and quelling the unrest if local authorities did not. How have the protesters and people generally reacted to that? Well, you know what's interesting is that the people out here haven't really heard the news. They've been focused on protesting for George Floyd. Now, um, I've spoken to other people who actually watched the president's uh, speech earlier, and uh, many of them are up in arms at trying to figure out exactly what is the president trying to do, because um, the big question is, can the president legally do that? Um, But we remember from back during the coronavirus pandemic, or during this pandemic, the president talked about uh, if the governors didn't want to do what he wanted them to do, then he was going to put something in place. But legally, from the uh, Constitution, he could not do that. So now, moving forward, uh, some governors, as you can imagine, are upset at what the president is trying to do. But many are saying they're going to fight it legally because they believe the president cannot do that. We have seen quite violent scenes from these protests and uh, police engagement with protesters, but it's not just the protesters, it's the press as well. So your colleague was arrested too. What did you make of that? Uh, And I wonder, uh, Lisa, forgive me if you do, um, there are police officers coming towards this area uh, to try to flee from the... uh, to get rid of the crowds here. So if you lose me, I apologize. Uh, but seeing Omar arrested, uh, that was, it really hurt me uh, because Omar is the consummate professional and he's also a dear friend of mine. And to see what happened to him really hurt me uh, watching him be arrested for, for no reason. Um, as a black man in this country that I am myself, the African American man, uh, seeing him arrested really brought back some flashbacks to what happened to me in my past when I was racially profiled for no reason. So to see what happened to him really hurt me. But the way he handled it, was incredibly professional. I'm so proud of him. But it also showed you that when it comes to black African-American men in this country, that there's a lot of still a lot of injustices. And so that's still a big concern. So right now, uh, I'm proud of him. uh, But I just wish things could have been handled a little bit better. Tell me what's going on right now. You say that the police have arrived. What are they doing? Right. Yeah. Right now, people are coming back towards me. The police apparently is on the other side. so, yeah, so that's kind of what's happening right now. I see people coming towards me, saying that the police are coming. Um, so I'm so protesters coming, coming towards coming? you, Daryl? Is, is the police officer, are police coming that way? Are the police over there? Okay, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Some uh, People were telling me earlier that they saw some police officers um, the other way because they're fully enforcing the 10 o'clock curfew. That curfew started about 20 minutes ago, Lisa. So uh, at this point, the people here are just... Uh, leaving and going to another direction. But um, now the big question is, when will law enforcement show up to enforce um, this uh, enforce this curfew? So uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see exactly what happens. Uh, a couple of days ago, when officers were, officers were enforcing the curfew, Lisa, uh, my colleagues and I actually got mace and pepper sprayed uh, by law enforcement, even though we showed them our, um, our credentials that we were with CNN. They had none of it. They still wanted to spray us. Um, and get us away. So um, at this point, law enforcement, they really don't care. They're just trying to fully enforce this curfew.
So, as you say, curfew has passed already. What's the attitude of the protesters to that curfew? Do they care? I, I, I don't know. I mean, we for us, for our safety, we have uh, forms if police ask us to leave. We have forms that show that we are allowed to be out during the curfew. Uh, but the protesters say they're not going anywhere anytime soon. They're going to keep protesting. They're going to keep having their voices heard until all four, all four police officers are in custody. And that is CNN correspondent Daryl Forges uh, reporting there from Minneapolis. An organiser of the Black Lives Matter protest in Christchurch is standing by his decision to help create the event despite social distancing rules not being followed. It was one of several events held around the country over the weekend in solidarity with protesters in the United States after the police killing of George Floyd. The Deputy Prime Minister, Winston Peters, says that the mass gatherings in this country should have resulted in prosecutions for breaching Level 2 restrictions. We cannot have rules where some people decide that they don't wish to comply and there are no consequences. Due to that, well, we've, got the long, we've got the wrong level of shutdown right now. But Will Hunter told our reporter, Matthew Tunison, that he stands by his decision to help organise the Christchurch event. I was in the Cathedral Square attending a climate protest the day of the mosque shootings and it feels very real... Um, to Christchurch, the issues around racism and just how violent and terrible um, the outcomes can be. Now, clearly you would have been aware of the COVID-19 restrictions under Level 2. Absolutely. How did that play on your mind when you were organising this? Yeah, so one of the things that was at the forefront of my mind was following the government guidelines for events. In all of our communication, we encourage people to um, wear masks, to not come if they felt unwell. Uh, and so stay socially distant. We were giving out face masks and disposable gloves at the protest, and we set out cones and barriers to try and encourage uh, people to separate into different sections. The original idea was to ask people to stay two metres apart from other bubbles. Unfortunately, due to the turnout, uh, that wasn't possible. And how many people turned up to the protest? I don't have a hard count, but Facebook says 700. Do you regret organising the protest? Not at all. I think it was incredibly important. It's really easy to just watch things happen and not do anything about it and things get worse and worse and worse. This situation in America has been building for quite some time. I don't regard the, what happened at the protest to be any worse than uh, going down to Westfield Rickerton on Saturday last week. Um, I would not have taken part in organising this uh, event if we'd still been in Level 3 or Level one, uh, Level 4. Okay. I take it you're not an epidemiologist or a I am not. Health no, I wouldn't clinician. claim to be. And these, um, these rules have been set out by people who are and by other Absolutely, experts. and that's why we did our best to follow them. But they weren't followed. But we did our best. Winston Peters saying that the organisers should be prosecuted. How do you respond to that? Uh, that was something that I was aware of the risk of when I um, decided to be involved. And have you been contacted by the police? Not yet. What if um, it turns out someone does have COVID-19 in in this group? That could potentially be pretty devastating. Absolutely. And I'd probably feel the same uh, sense of responsibility as the person in charge of opening Westfield and having several thousand people through there on Saturday. And that's Will Hunter, who helped to organise Saturday's protest in Christchurch, speaking to Matthew Tunison. And it is 19 minutes after six. You're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Talk of returning the country to a new normal has been welcomed with cautious optimism, but those who are eagerly awaiting a change warn the devil is in the detail. The Prime Minister this morning signalled that the Cabinet will look at returning to Alert Level 1 next Monday, sooner than expected. It will be uncharted waters for this country, which has never been in Alert Level 1 since restrictions were introduced in March. Catherine Hutton reports. On March the 21st, Jacinda Ardern introduced the Alert Level framework and announced that the country was currently at Alert Level 2. So what does Level 1 look like? According to the Ministry of Health's COVID website, at Level 1 the disease is contained in New Zealand. While it is uncontrolled overseas, there could be isolated household transmission in this country. Border restrictions, testing and self-isolation remain, but there are no restrictions on gathering or domestic transport. Physical distancing is encouraged and contacts must still be tracked. 
Chris Roberts, the chief executive of the Tourism Industry Association, says the earlier guidance suggested mass gatherings of over 500 people wouldn't be allowed. But he's hopeful that will change when the government specifies what conditions they will impose when they make their decision. That would be quite restrictive still on a whole lot of events from sporting events to music concerts and and just general gatherings of people, uh, all of which are are features of tourism. So uh, we'd be looking for some guidance and hopefully some leniency on the size of gatherings that are allowed. Uh, And of course, uh, for tourism, the borders remain closed and that means until they open, we're limited to domestic tourism only. He'd also like to see the restrictions around transport lifted so planes and buses can operate with greater capacity. The president of the Restaurant Association, Mike Egan, says restaurants are currently having to turn people away. A move to Level 1 would be extremely welcome, especially in an industry which already has very narrow profit margins. Everything's back to normal, no social distancing. You know, we can put our tables back into our restaurants. Um, We don't have to limit to 100 and we don't have to keep a register, but people that are feeling unwell or whatever should not, um, you know, they should seek, seek medical advice, which should be, I guess, happen um, all the time anyway, if people are feeling unwell. So, yeah, as far as I can, can, can uh, understand what I've read, um, yeah, it's back to, back to sort of how it was pretty much. Wellington Sky Stadium has a capacity of 35,000 people. Its chief executive, Shane Harmon, says if the government gives the green light to Level 1, they're ready to welcome the crowds back for the Hurricanes versus the Crusaders game on June the 21st for the second round of the new rugby competition. At the moment, under Level 1, there are no restrictions on social gatherings, but he says requirements to contact Trace and encouragement for physical distancing will continue. We're likely to have some distancing measures around catering and toilets, etc. And prior to lockdown for the last few events, we did have additional cleaning measures, hand sanitizer stations and lots of public messaging around the venue, which we would expect would continue. But hopefully nothing that will uh, make it too operationally difficult to comply with. So fingers crossed the uh, restrictions remain as is on the website. He'll wait to see if the Ministry makes any changes to its advice, but says they will only run events if they can comply with the official guidelines. Across town, the much smaller Bat Theatre has been experimenting with how it can produce work online. This Friday, it's running its second stream, hosting a cocktail hour. Its general manager, Jonathan Hendry, says a move to level one isn't like turning on a tap. Just as we've been... Thinking about uh, the team of five million, you know, hey, Waka Ike Noa, we're all in this together. Our approach is going to be slow and steady, reviewing things, testing things out with our audiences, because it's partly our audiences and partly us that need to work together on making a safe space under, under level one to go through winters. Tourism's chief executive says the alert levels were pulled together in a very short space of time. And while a good job was done, given the time pressure officials were under, he says now might be a good opportunity to look at what is appropriate under each level. For Checkpoint, Catherine Hassan. A short-phasing traffic light at Roadworks is being blamed for causing hundreds of holidaymakers to get caught in gridlock traffic in the Awakenod Gorge in Taranaki yesterday. But the transport agency says poor behaviour from motorists running red lights compounded the problem. Our Taranaki Whanganui reporter Robin Martin has more. Cindy Verner and her family were travelling home to Taranaki from Taupo yesterday when they struck bumper-to-bumper traffic in the Awakeno Gorge, stretching back hundreds of metres. She didn't see anyone running a red light, but was suspicious that the traffic lights were not working properly. There were um, three sets of lights and unfortunately they weren't timed, so people coming one way, um, there just wasn't enough time for all the cars to get past so that the people going the other way could get by. So, yeah, we just got stuck for about an hour and a half. It was just a a massive uh, mess up, really. The police were on the same page as Ms Werner, issuing an alert at 3 o'clock, warning of delays in the Awakino Gorge because of faulty traffic lights. Ms Werner says if contractors had been on site in anticipation of the long weekend traffic, the gridlock could have been avoided, faulty lights or not. If they had just had some people out there, you know, one at each traffic light that could have been managing it, that would have helped, or, or if they had just made it all one long roadworks instead of 
three separate ones. That was, that was really the problem, that there were three separate ones. And, and you'd get through one, but then you couldn't get through the next, and, and everybody was just stuck. Nobody could go anywhere. But earlier today, New Plymouth Mayor Neil Holdham, like many others, was under the impression poorly behaved drivers caused the jam. My understanding is that some people have bucked the trend and run red lights and caused major congestion. And so that's obviously a concern. One, people have got to understand that it's pretty hard to back up a 50-tonne truck on a winding state highway. And, and two, it, it's a sign that we've just got to get on and get these works done as soon as possible. Mr Holdham was reluctant to blame the transport agency. It's safe to assume as a transport operator that people understand that a red light means stop. And if people want to ignore that and, and cause problems, I don't think you can turn around and say having a... I mean, having a person there would have stopped that for sure, but I, I don't think it's something that we've seen before and it's not something they should have expected. Mr Holdham, however, was confident that travellers will not be put off returning to Taranaki. The Transport Agency is investing hundreds of millions of dollars upgrading State Highway 3, including building a $30 million bypass at the Awakino Tunnel. The agency declined an interview, but in a statement, Acting Portfolio Delivery Manager Joe Wilton says crews were dispatched to Awakino about midday when increasing delays were first noticed. However, due to the volume of traffic and poor driver behaviour, it took until about 5.30 for traffic to clear. Ms Wilton says the agency understands that delays would have been frustrating and it is investigating the incident. Meanwhile, Cindy Werner was happy to see the upside of the delay. Jumped out, had a little chat. Um, somebody asked us if we had a barbecue, but we didn't, and saw some people dancing along the side of the road. Everybody was quite happy, but... Um, you know, nobody was really getting upset about the situation, but it was, um, it was uh, a long wait. And as if to rub salt into its wounds, the transport agency had another incident causing delays in Taranaki this morning. A truck transporting a 64 metre long blade of a wind turbine destined for the YPP wind farm near Waverley toppled over on the outskirts of Okato on State Highway 45. I Taranaki mo te hōtaka o te ahi pō nei. Ko Robin Martin ahau. The Japanese city of Yamato has proposed banning the use of smartphones while walking. And the city is not alone. A rise in pedestrians glued to their phones, oblivious to those around them, has forced authorities in many countries to take action against smombies, smartphone zombies, as the BBC's Siobhan Leahy reports. Smombie short for smartphone zombie, has been affectionately used to describe the mindlessly strolling pedestrians whose heads are bent, their attention consumed by their devices. Studies show that more and more smombies are taking to the streets and authorities, concerned about the threat they pose to themselves and to traffic, have been trying to curb the peril. The German cities of Augsburg and Cologne had one idea, installing ground-level traffic lights at tram crossings. On both sides of the road, they place lights, each about the size of a beer mat, in an attempt to grab the attention of the smombies. In South Korea, a telecom regulator created an app that stopped people's phones from functioning while they walked. Now, one city in Japan wants to go one step further and ban the practice entirely. My colleague Will Leonardo used to live in Japan and he told me more. Well, in essence, it's a ban that's come in place in this city called Yamato near Tokyo. And they did a study earlier this year which showed that about 12% of people were walking around glued to their smartphones, essentially, obviously looking down and not looking around them, oblivious to those around them. And uh, what they're planning is they're not going to find anyone, but they're going to put people on street corners, near parks, that sort of thing, to, to kind of tell people, you know, you're not allowed to do this anymore, you need to look up. Um, and it's just part, it's part of a wider kind of concept in Japan. It's a concept called mewaku, which kind of means annoyance or try not to get in the way of anyone else, so to speak. Smombies are on the radar of other governments around the world, including here in Britain. Joshua Harris is from the UK road safety charity Break. Well, interestingly, here in the UK, the government's actually said that it's going to look into the issue um, of smartphone zombies, in particular for, for child pedestrian casualties, because, um, in fact, it's found to be the, the highest contributing factor. So the, the issue which causes those casualties for people aged 7 to 16 is actually failing, failing to look because of their mobile phones or listening to music. So, you know, this is a really urgent issue, and the government's going to look at the data on this and find out what action needs to be taken 
In China, the city of Chongcheng introduced a 30-metre smartphone lane for pedestrians. There, they have their own term for smombies, a phrase which literally translates as the bowed head tribe. And that was Siobhan Leahy. And let's get some of your feedback before we head off about the armed response teams. This is the police teams. This person says, constantly hearing ARTs being compared to US-style policing. Have these New Zealanders so quickly forgotten our closest partner, Australia, where police are routinely armed and specialist armed teams also patrol? Let's also not forget armed response vehicles, which the UK utilises in its everyday policing. Commentators in New Zealand should not be comparing New Zealand to a country with an extreme extreme cultural difference in its policing style. Another person, though, says no guns for New Zealand police. They should not follow the current dreadful failed US policing policies. Our police and management uh, and union so stupid that they can't see where this will lead. We're back tomorrow. RNZ News headlines at half past six. Tensions are escalating in a number of US states as people defy curfews to demonstrate in the seventh night of protests. An organiser of the Black Lives Matter solidarity protest in Christchurch says despite the event breaking Level 2 rules, it's no worse than busy shopping malls. Hawke's Bay officials say long-awaited rainfall yesterday should bring grass growth, but it's not a drought breaker. And a Māori associate professor of law says there is no doubt there is racism in the New Zealand police. Those are the headlines. Our next news will be at 7, then it's nights with Brian Crump. Tonight on Nights, a new series, After the Virus, in which Guy and Espina make sense of a world rendered anew by a global pandemic. This evening, the scientist who argues the COVID shutdown has not bought us more time to reduce our carbon